we use chemical formulas to represent compounds um, because it's just a, a nice shorthand way of, of doing it and then we understand what we're talking about. Because they have constant composition, then we can represent them in a chemical formula. The chemical formula is going to indicate the different elements that are present in that compound and how many atoms of each element are present in one unit of that. So we use subscripts to indicate the number of atoms and by convention if we have a subscript of one we don't write that because if there were zero oxygen atoms we wouldn't write the O. So I wrote the O, that means there's at least one, I didn't write another number so it must be one. It's just this thing of chemists not writing ones. Just, I don't know, it's, we're prejudiced against ones or something. So here's examples. Um, NaCl, sodium chloride, table salt. So Na and Cl, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. There's one sodium atom for every chloride, chlorine atom. Okay, so <coughs> NaCl. CO2 is the formula for carbon dioxide. It has one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. The subscript goes to the right of the element symbol. It comes after, so we've got oxygen and the two is telling us there's two of them. There's no number after the C and so we understand that there's one. Down here this is the formula for sucrose, which we call sugar. C12, H22, O11. So in one unit of table sugar, there's 12 carbon atoms, 22 hydrogen atoms, and 11 oxygen atoms. It's a lot of atoms all bonded together in one molecule. The subscripts are important. They're part of the formula. They're part of the compound's definition. And if you change those, you change the compound, and it's not the same name anymore. So here's an example of two compounds that have very similar formulas, CO and CO2. Just different by this little two here. This one has one carbon and one oxygen atom. This one has one carbon and two oxygen atoms. Carbon monoxide is uh, bad stuff. It's an air pollutant. It, uh, it's a byproduct of gas appliances that aren't vented properly every year in the United States. I don't know how many people it kills, but if your house is tight and your your gas furnace isn't vented and isn't functioning very well, it will, as it burns the gas, it will give off carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. And then when you breathe carbon monoxide, it will suffocate you, and it's just a really nasty, nasty situation. Carbon dioxide, very, very similar chemical formula, not, not toxic. Now any gas that you breathe that doesn't have any oxygen in it will kill you. The, the nasty thing about carbon monoxide is your blood bonds to the carbon monoxide better than it does to oxygen. And so even though there's some oxygen present, you will still suffocate. Carbon dioxide doesn't do that. When we breathe in we breathe in oxygen and our body does a bunch of chemical reactions and then we breathe out carbon dioxide. There's a lot of carbon dioxide in the air, it doesn't hurt us at all. And the difference is one oxygen atom. Those subscripts are important. You change the subscript, you change the compound, you change the properties. Um, sometimes students are curious, well, why do you put the carbon first and then the oxygen? Why do you put the sodium first and then the chlorine? There is a pattern to it and this is more for those who are curious. We're not going to get real hung up on this. But generally speaking, the, the chemical uh, that is most metallic comes first. So you say, well, you know, carbon dioxide, I'm looking at the periodic table, and carbon and oxygen, those are both nonmetals. Yeah, but carbon's closer to the metals. Okay, so it also kind of ends up being a left to right thing on the periodic table, which actually makes a lot more sense. If you're looking on the periodic table and you're going left to right, which one do you come across first? Well, you come the carbon first and then the oxygen, so the carbon goes first. Um, here's sodium. Sodium's way over here on the left side, and chlorine's over there. It's on the right side. So the pattern is the more metallic element goes first. Um, 
And it's not that we wouldn't understand what you mean. It's that it just sounds silly. It sounds like baby talk. You know, little children say all kinds of crazy things. My second son, when he was little, he, he referred to a cash register as the dollar biller. You know, he was pointy eyes as the dollar biller. Well, I knew what he meant. He also called his big toe his fat toe. You know, I know what he means, but it was silly, right? And so a chemist looks at CLNA, and it's like, what are you talking about? That's dumb. Do I know what you mean? Yeah, but it's just dumb. So we put the NA first and then the CL. NO, N2O and not ON2. As we look at these, nitrogen is closer to the metals than oxygen, and so it comes first. Then they give you this, this list, and so that's, that's nice. There are some historical exceptions, um, like hydroxide ion is always written OH minus. It violates that rule. It involves hydrogen. Hydrogen violates most of the rules. So let's do this example. Write a chemical formula for each component. Component. Each compound. I'm losing my ability to read. Okay, a compound containing two silver atoms for every sulfur atom. Well, which one's going to come first? Silver or sulfur? Silver, because silver's a metal. What's the symbol for silver? AG. Mm. Okay, AG. And it says there's two of them. So subscript 2. And then sulfur, and it says there's one of those, right? So that's the first one. Okay, two nitrogen atoms for every oxygen atom. Which comes first, nitrogen or oxygen? Nitrogen. It's to the left on the periodic table. N2O. And a subscript is sunk down and small. A superscript is up and small. It's like Superman flying over, right? And sub is like submarine going under. I occasionally get people who don't know the difference. That would make life confusing in chemistry class. Two iron atoms for three oxygen atoms. Well, which comes first, Fe or O? Fe, that's the metal. Fe, and there's two of them, so subscript two. O, make sure that's a capital O. And it says there's three of them. <coughs> yes? On uh, in the N2O, we, that be, we see it as uh, dinitrogen monoxide. Di N2O would be dinitrogen monoxide. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to learn how to do in this <coughs> nomenclature lab that we're going to do. Um, so we have. We have atoms, and then we also have groups of atoms um, with a charge. Oh, let me back up a little bit. We learned what ions were. Ions are atoms that have a charge on them, right? Positive or negative. We can also have groups of atoms that together have a charge, and those are called polyatomic ions. Poly means many atoms, many atom ions. And so some of them have these polyatomic ions. Those act as a group. A unit. When we have two or more of those, then we put parentheses around them. I think of them as being like a bundle pack. When you go to Costco and you buy a Wii, okay, you don't just get the Wii, right? You get an extra controller and you get two games. And they're all shrink wrapped together and they come as a package, right? You can't just get the game. It comes all together. Polyatomics are like a bundle pack. They're bundled, they're shrink wrapped together. And when we have more than one, we put parentheses, which are like the shrink wrap around the outside, to say we've got two or three or whatever of these groups. Okay? Um, so that's what polyatomic ions are. Let's look at an example of this. So here, MgNO32, right here in the middle of all this nonsense. Mg, the way you would read this out loud, you would say it out loud as you say Mg. N, O, 3, 2. Not 32, because there's a parenthesis in there separating it. 
So inside the parentheses, we've got this NO3 group. Does that look familiar from your memorization material? That's the nitrate ion. Now we're getting to part of why I made you memorize those things. So that's the nitrate ion. It acts like a group. It has a negative one charge. So when we have two of those, we put parentheses, we put shrink wrap around the outside of it, and on the outside, we put the two. So this has one magnesium atom and two of these nitrate groups. Because if we don't have that parenthesis, then we end up with something like this, MgNO32. And that looks like 32 oxygens, doesn't it? And that's not what we meant. Question? How come it doesn't have the negative sign? How come it doesn't have the negative sign? That's a good question. Because the magnesium has a positive charge, and when we put them together, they cancel out. And we'll learn a little more about that soon, but that's a good question. So to avoid misunderstandings, we put parentheses in there, and then we can see, oh, it's two of those groups. We only use the parentheses when we have more than one. If there's just one, then we don't need the parentheses. So examples. Determine the number of each type of atom in the following formulas. So K2SO4. So there are three elements in here because there's three capital letters. So we've got K, we have S, and we have O. How many Ks are there? Two. Two. How many S's? One, and how many oxygens? Well, that was pretty easy, huh? What are the elements in part B? Aluminum, sulfur, and oxygen. How many aluminums? Two. How many sulfurs? Three. How many oxygens? Twelve. Because there's three bundle packs. It's like three wagons. Four wheels on each wagon, three wagons, we've got twelve. Another way to think of it is it distributes on the outside of the parentheses. You're multiplying, and it multiplies everything on the inside. So whichever way makes sense to you, go for that. There are different types of chemical formulas. There are empirical formulas, molecular formulas, and structural formulas. Empirical formulas give us relative numbers of atoms in a molecule, but not necessarily the actual number. It's, it's just the ratio, the proportion. The molecular formula gives us the actual number of el- atoms of each element in one molecule. And the structural formula is helpful because it shows us how those atoms are connected together. And you can have two different compounds that have the same molecular formula but the atoms are connected in different ways, and so their structural formulas are different and their properties are different. Um, We sometimes use molecular models. uh, It's like a ball and stick model to represent molecules. And these are, we, we tend to use the same colors to represent these common um, elements. You don't need to memorize those. The ball and sticks, we represent the atoms as balls and the chemical bonds that hold them together as sticks. It's a little like playing with Tinker Toys. And then there are space-filling models, which actually show you more realistically the shape of the molecule. (coughs) So we get some pictures coming up here. So this is a molecular formula for methane. It shows us there's one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms in one molecule of methane. The empirical formula would give us the simplest ratio. So that would be CH4 would still be the empirical formula as well. We'll talk more about empirical formulas. But it's like the lowest, um, it's like a reduced fraction. So molecular formula, this is a structural formula because it shows us how they are connected that all four hydrogen atoms are connected to carbon in the center. You can imagine that there might be some other ways to put those together. This is a ball and stick model where we're representing hydrogen as white balls and carbon as a black ball, and we have sticks connecting them. 
That's not actually what the methane molecule looks like, though. And yet it is useful to us because it's easier to see what's going on on the inside. This is a space-filling model. These are generally computer-generated, and that's going to give you a better idea of what the shape of the actual molecule is. The geometry of molecules can be, can be really important.